joining me and thank you to all of you on X who are joining me. Let me tell you what's coming up. Uh, we'll be talking with a herbalist about what she believes the power of herbs truly is. Uh, plus, um, a, a young man who's running from underground station to underground station to raise money for calm. Why he's doing that, why he feels male's uh, mental health is so important, as indeed it is, uh, his own story, we'll be talking with him a little later. But I, I guess the spotlight has been very rightly on what's happening uh, in Israel, what's happening in Gaza at the moment. Uh, we've talked with a very powerful talk, which I know has affected all of us, um, with our, our imam and um, our, our rabbi, who we've actually asked to, to stand by throughout the program in case we, we need them back in again. We may well be talking to them before the end of the show again. Um, also, we've talked with Julia Samuel, psychotherapist, about the effects of uh, seeing the pictures, seeing the headlines, what they, the, the, the way it affects us viscerally. Uh, and my next guest is um, one I'm very excited to talk with again. Um, San Vaknin is Israeli. He's in Macedonia at the moment. Um, he's a professor of clinical psychology, absolutely fascinating. And I'll tell you why he's joining me today. It's to talk about conflict, in particular, the sorts of personalities behind uh, the Israeli-Palestine conflict at the moment. Sam, thank you so much for joining me again. Um, just reading through some of the notes you've sent me, I'm like, wow, this is a totally different and a really interesting take on all of this. Uh, let me start off by asking, and I, I have asked all of my guests, uh, how, are you, how are you feeling? Because I, I don't you know, take lightly that you may well know people and, and, and what have you, and it would yeah. be, uh, I have how hundreds, are you feeling? I have hundreds of relatives in the, in the war zones, both in the north and the south. I haven't slept a wink <laughs> for quite a few nights now, as you can see, probably. So I'm not in the best of shape, but I I will give I'll give you whatever I can. <laughs> thank you, thank you, and I know you can't even get a flight back home at the moment because I flights, can't get so. a flight back. No, Israel is is actually cut off. Yeah, yeah. You when you look at the personalities, and I think there are interesting ones involved. When you look at Bibi Netanyahu, he's it's what his eighth time around now. And many people are saying, uh, are pointing out that the reason he, quote unquote, took his eye off the ball is when you need power at any cost and you bring in cronies, people who will back you up, um, you are often displacing people who are very, very learned in their trade, in, in security, in the military and what have you. You're displacing them with your, <laughs> your buddies, your political buddies. What that it seems to me that the need for power underlines so much of the world's conflict and and i'm really fascinating to hear your your views on this the diseased leadership of both the state of israel and the hamas and i'm using the word diseased judiciously definitely clinically has to do with underlying factors which are actually not personal. Leaders, leaders reflect constituencies. The psychology of leader, leaders resonates very closely with the psychopathology of their electorates and nations. So here we have two peoples, two nations, and they are both exhibiting what we call in psychology a trauma response. Now we have four types of trauma response and the most famous of which is fight or flight. So in this case we have fight. Both nations are traumatized and both are in a post-traumatic condition. As you recall, the Jewish people has, has just had in historical terms, just yesterday, the Holocaust. And the Palestinians had something they called the Nakba, which means in Arabic, the catastrophe, which is the expulsion in 1948 uh, from their territories, which now constitute the state of Israel. Mm -hmm. So they are both traumatized. And when people are traumatized, they tend to perceive themselves as victims. 
the victimhood, their victimhood becomes their identity politics. And this is called in clinical psychology, competitive victimhood. No, I'm the bigger victim. No, I'm the bigger victim. And they compete for victimhood. And so when you compete for victimhood, when victimhood is who you are, you feel entitled to special treatment. You feel much less empathetic towards the other party. You feel egotistic, you're self-centered on your needs and priorities and so on and so forth on recovery. And many, many victims, true victims, mm -hmm. become very self-destructive. Unfortunately, in both nations, the Israelis who are Jews and the Palestinians in both nations, there's a founding myth of suicide. In Israel, we have the story of Masada. Masada was the resistance in a fortress in the, in the desert against the Roman army. And then all the fighters there committed suicide when things were look to be, you know, beyond hope. Mm. The Masada myth is a foundational myth of the state of Israel. Every child learns it. It's inculcated in us. And the Arabs have the concept of, uh, the Muslims actually, have the concept, so, concept of shahada. Shahada means martyrdom, to be a martyr. And to be a martyr is to die. Mm -hmm. And to commit suicide in Masada is to die. This is, this is a death ethos, an ethos of death. These are two death cults at war. I know, not politically correct. No, but, but what, 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 it, what, it, what it speaks to then, if you have an upbringing or if uh, you have a society through which such a message runs all the way through, your way of your your dialogue when we talk about peace dialogue and and often well right from the beginning of the the creation of of israel and what happened with uh, you know uh, with the seven hundred thousand palestinians being displaced it was people from other cultures parachuting in to draw lines either on a map or either in the sand um, with their Western, no knowledge of that. This is what we need to do right from the days of Balfour, historically going all the way through. So uh, even Jimmy Carter, um, but, but one of the things that my husband and uh, myself are talking about is every time there's been a leader from those groups, uh, they've been assassinated. Uh, take it, if, if they speak against that language, if they speak one of peace and hope and I guess non-victimhood, they're taken out. Yes, that's because victimhood, as I said, is an identity politics. And like all forms of identity politics, it involves a series of psychological defense mechanisms which lead inexorably to violence. With your permission, I will enumerate these defense mechanisms without yeah. going into too, many, too much detail. Mm -hmm. The foremost mechanism is known as splitting. Splitting or dichotomous thinking simply means I'm all good. My enemy is all bad. Mm -hmm. I am perfect. Whoever disagrees with me is evil and must die. This is splitting. It's a defense mechanism that operates in individuals and in collectives. Then you have paranoid ideation. It's me against the world. As a victim, I've been victimized, means the world didn't help me. So I have to rely only on myself. And all the rest of the world are potential enemies. Mm -hmm. I should be hypervigilant. There are conspiracies everywhere. That's paranoia. And then another form of defense is grandiosity, especially if you have existential anxiety if you're not really sure that you're going to be here tomorrow, mm -hmm. if you have true enemies who seek to exterminate you, eradicate you, displace you, whatever, one of the main defense mechanisms we have as individuals and collectives is grandiosity. It's a form of mm -hmm. cognitive distortion. It impairs our reality testing. We don't perceive reality correctly anymore. So Israel, for example, has this misguided belief that it is untouchable, invincible, 
immune to the consequences of its actions. This is a form of, of grandiosity, of course. And of course, the, the other party, the Palestinians, have their own type of grandiosity. They are the perfect victims. No one has ever been victimized as they have. That renders them unique. And they're entitled to special treatment and special concessions, and they have rights that impose obligations on others. It's a form of grandiosity, entitled grandiosity. And then we have magical thinking. If we just put our minds to it, there is nothing we cannot accomplish. Mm. Mm. Our thinking, our words, our wishes and dreams and, and hopes, they are reality. We have absolute influence and we can shape the cosmos around us, our environment. This is magical thinking. It's not true. But then reality something is... like this, but, but then something, somebody takes that action um that changes that that friction between two similar ideologies if you like somebody just steps way outside of that uh i guess they have to do something horrific in order to what up the ante to become i'm just thinking with, with, with the hamas doing what they did that is a a massive upping of the horrific ante Yes, everything I've just described is known collectively as pathological narcissism. Mm. And in pathological narcissism, you need to be noticed. Your existence mm. relies crucially on what we call external regulation. Feedback from the outside, input from others, regulates your moods, your emotions, your reactions, who you are, how you perceive the world, and so on. But how are you going to be noticed? in a rapid news cycle with two zillion social media accounts with mm -hmm. cats with cats and semi-naked people all around <laughs> how are you going to be noticed ostentatiousness so you need to be you need to become ostentatious you need to escalate your behavior and the more atrocious you are the more abominable and abhorrent and so on the more likely you are to garner the attention that you need Mm -hmm. This is, by just, the way... I was going to say, just to let me remind people, I'm talking with Sam Vaknin, who's a professor of clinical psychology. So, Sam, just tell me, and I, from what you're saying then, if you have to escalate things to be noticed to such a horrific level, the media using lots and lots and lots of, of uh, photographs, more and more and more and more and more, that surely feeds the monster. Yes, actually, um, both parties abuse the media, social media included, mainstream legacy media, social media, all forms of media, all forms of access. It's not only media, it's access. Mm. They abuse this to do something manipulative, and it's called projective identification. Mm. Projective identification is when I force my adversary or my enemy or another party, I force them to behave in a way which conforms to my expectations of them and also presents me in a good light. So if I expect you to abuse me, mm. I will provoke you. I will push your buttons. I will escalate my behavior until you do abuse me. And that would confirm my position that you're an abuser. Mm. And that would also make me the good guy, because here I am being abused by you, being victimized by you. And, and that's how they use, and that's how they would use those, the, the photos and the pictures and what yes. have you, um, does what? Make them more, well, uh, they are victims, but it makes sure that you can't ignore that. There are no saints in this uh, conflict. I I think that the problem is that people define themselves as victims. Victimhood is an identity. Being victimized is a series of events and behaviors or misbehaviors. It doesn't make you a victim. It means that you have been victimized. Yeah. Victimhood is a totally different thing yeah. because it involves entitlement at the expense of another person. And of course the media are harnessed and leveraged and used and abused by all the parties. These are signals. This theory is known in psychology as signaling theory. 
the parties are signaling to each other via the media and use the media in order to induce and modify the behaviors of the other side in a way that would reflect well on them and would confirm their prejudices and biases regarding the other side. And this is a form of aggression which involves gaslighting, the alteration of, of reality in counterfactual ways, and also involves projective identification. I'm going to make what? you do what I want you to do, what I want and you to do. I was going to say, where does anger is, uh, I mean, not just um, anger from the parties involved, but anger from all of those watching from, uh, well, let me say, like news commentators and what have you. Whenever I see shouting and anger around this, it's a horrific issue. But whenever I see colleagues in the media shouting and angry, I see that as them fueling the flames um am i wrong is i would beg to differ with the word anger not your fault by the way it looks like anger <laughs> ah. it's it's righteous indignation it's a form of virtue signaling yeah. it's ostentatious it has nothing to do with real anger because you see real anger is a good thing Real anger is a way to affect your environment and to modify other people's behaviors so that you won't have to be angry anymore. Mm. This is not anger. This is victimhood, self-righteous, sanctimonious, 100% good, while the other party is always 100% evil. Okay, we, we've got to, Sam, we've got to take a break. I'm going to come back and talk with you more. I'm talking with Sam Vaknin, Professor of Clinical Psychology. Uh, back with more in just a moment.
Welcome back and thank you for joining me. I'm having an absolutely fascinating conversation with Sam uh, Vaknin, who is a renowned international um, professor of clinical psychology, usually based in Israel. As we heard, he can't get back there. He's uh, in Macedonia at the moment. Sam, coming back to when you've got two parties who see that almost as a competition of who can be the biggest victim, what is the answer then? How do you create peace when you've got two traumatized as you explained the, uh, the the jewish people with their trauma the palestinians with their trauma how you can't do therapy for, for hundreds of thousands of people how, how and as we said before those people who have tried to create peace and become close to it get assassinated i mean historically um it seems that governments uh, peoples go back to and you said they made that point the leaders that they that mirror their grief they hamas became a, a political party but still always have that it's like the ira when Sinn fein it, it's it's like with uh, you know people forget that nelson mandela came from a once terrorist organization so you've got the the jews with bibi netanyahu coming back the jewish people yet he gets back again you've got hammers how, how do you what is the answer what is the answer you can't do therapy for hundreds of thousands of people millions of people what is the answer the situation is calls for pessimism however there are two mitigating mitigating circumstances or mitigating mitigating aspects mm -hmm. we distinguish between cultures and societies which look to the past and cultures and societies with a future orientation. Mm -hmm. Now, the cultures and societies in the Middle East, the Arab world, the Jews, they are past oriented. They, their nourishment is based in the past, not in the future. They derive their sustenance, their strength, their resilience, everything from the past. Mm -hmm. So this is the first thing. If we succeed somehow to change this orientation and to render it present or future orientation, I think this would go a long way towards kind of pacifying both both peoples. Because but where, where does, that, now... does that come from? I was going to say, because the traditions, everything about uh, both Islam and Judaism, the traditions, everything is, as you say, how you map out your day your week your month your years based in the past to change that orientation does that come from their face basis does that i mean if somehow you could uh, approach we we had earlier on a, a fantastic imam and and a, a rabbi who who have come together and are supporting each other and seem to be speaking of the future so is that possibly where that focusing uh, uh, and basing themselves on the future is that a place from which it could come past orientation has to do with what we call learned helplessness the belief that everything is hopeless that regardless of your best efforts you will never be efficacious you will never accomplish long-term goals and everything that you do accomplish is transitory and meaningless so if we were to establish an environment, and here the Western world has a major role, it's, as does China and so on. If we were to establish an, an all-encompassing environment, which includes, incorporates both the Arabs and the Jews, in a way that guarantees them stability and safety mm -hmm. and long-term prospects and economic development and jobs for all, etc., etc., I think the hopelessness and helplessness will abate. And with these, the past orientation will be replaced with a future orientation. Mm, the second a thing. Ask. Which, <laughs> it's a big ask it's, because it's we're talking done, about it's territories. Been done, it's been done before. For example, right. the Marshall Plan in Europe. Yeah, yeah. It's been done before in Japan after the Second World War. The United States is spending six billion dollars a month a year in the middle east this money on weapons mind you only on weapons yeah. i mean take this money and use it differently 
same money, no need for appropriations, no need to negotiate with the Republican Party, same money. <laughs> so this is the first thing. The second kind of ray of light, hope, is the fact that societies in the Middle East, Jews included, are shame-based, reputation-based. The social control is exerted and channeled through shaming people, humiliating them, mm. criticizing them in public, um, damaging their reputation irrevocably. Mm. So this, these are the levers of social control. Mm. Now, this is very bad because you need to save face. And in order to save face, you act irrationally. Like saving, it's save face or die. Liberty, you know, liberty or death. So saving face or death. That's it. Literally, people are willing to die to save face. Mm -hmm. If we were to transition from a reputation and shame-based society to a society of rule of law, objective and neutral measurements and evaluations, a society that doesn't shame people, or humiliate them, but teaches them and educates them and nurtures them, then I think we will have removed another component of this endless, seemingly endless and intractable conflict. Mm -hmm. You see, this is the cycle. This is exactly the cycle. The Jews yeah. live in the yeah. past. The Jews live in the past. The Palestinians live in the past. Both of them have been shamed and humiliated. Now the Hamas humiliated Israel shamed yeah, Israel. Yeah. Is Israel acting rationally? Allow me to have my doubts. Is Israel acting proportionately? Almost for sure it's not. Why? Because Israel has to save face. It has to restore its deterrence and it, the respect and the awe that it used to be held in. It's all about reputation. It's exactly like the mafia, exactly like a mob, a mob mentality, you know. And I so, guess you could say the same about Hamas. They had to save absolutely. face. Uh, everybody yes, say, do you think it's absolutely. time? To, we, we've got to finish this interview, but I, part of me thinks is, isn't it time that women t took over? I mean, I say that glibly, but so much of it is bound up in the sorts of things I guess we attribute to, to, to men, saving face, muscle, might, aggression, or I, those are, are attributes that are, are very male. We're talking maybe about societies in which the man has a, a role that many would say is adhering more to the past because younger people, as we've seen on both sides, don't adhere as much to that. So part of me thinks maybe it's time for the world to have a good go at women running it. I mean, can we do much worse? I, I well, mean, this, I don't mean to joke. Be true. <laughs> this might be true in the West, but regrettably in these areas, mm -hmm. in the Middle East and so on, there is full, uh, full collaboration between men and women in, in perpetuating this state of affairs. Yeah. Women have been co-opted. Mm -hmm. Women have been co-opted into the male patriarchy, basically, mm -hmm. into the male mm -hmm. you know, structure. Well, Sam, thank you. As always, it, it, it's it's fascinating talking to you, and I I really um, um I I send you my my warmest wishes. It must be I know it's a very going to be a very very difficult time for you. It is as well. Thank you for yeah, thank you for your and sentiments. I, yeah, I, thank I, and you. thank you. I, I I mean that because all of our guests that we've had from the area, I'm like God. How you lack of sleep and the churning of stomachs and all of those things going on and even be able to focus or gather their thoughts uh, it's not something that i take lightly so i do thank you again i want to say one last thing i want to say yeah. one last thing this is a crisis definitely but yeah. it's also an opportunity in 1973 israel has been surprised there was a surprise attack on israel by egypt yes. and syria and it led four years later to peace yeah. peace with egypt later peace with jordan and so on mm. This horrible atrocity committed by the terrorist organization Hamas could be an opening. It doesn't need to end this way. No. You could reconceive of it and reframe it and leverage it to make peace. Mm. Unfortunately, I don't see the leadership there yeah. to do this on either side. It's sad.
Sam, thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having Sam, me. You're, you're so welcome. We'll, we'll definitely be talking with you again. I know we will be in the future. Uh, Professor of Clinical Psychology, Sam Vaknin there, uh, as you heard, he's, he's Israeli, can't get back to Israel because there aren't any flights. So he's in uh, Macedonia at the moment. Um, lots to think about there, lots to think about there. Uh, we're gonna take a quick break. And after that, we'll be back on a totally different subject our I Believe segment, where we hear from a herbalist. Back with that in a, just a moment. <laughs> 